start saying how lucky Christians are. Because they, uh, they arise from really engaging and a sense of, uh, yeah, there has to have been some kind of reflection going on. And your questions are all um, nice and juicy. Mm -hmm. so they really are really show me that you're really engaging and, um, yeah. So thank you for that. And when I read them I think, yes, that's my question too. <laughs> <laughs> And in some ways, the answer is always the same. You can always say to you, well, you know, you know you can answer that yourself. <laughs> Nonetheless, I think it's very helpful to spend time together thinking about it and you know, kind of pondering about it. One could become too self-conscious about being a spiritual materialist, couldn't one? And it's not agonising over that. Thinking, oh dear, you know, how can I make sure I'm not a spiritual materialist? <laughs> Which is another ism. <laughs> you know, trying to be perfect, trying to be beyond criticism. I know that was very strong in my first motivation for trying to practice Dharma was to be beyond criticism. <laughs> yeah. it, uh, I get criticised for enough things that, you know, perhaps they're not, gen you know, not really what I should be criticised for. But if I were to reach enlightenment and perfection, I'd be beyond all that. It's kind of ironical, isn't it? Uh, trying to be perfect isn't going to do it. Because it's again... It's again a kind of project, isn't it? That you've projected into the future and you've, you've taken on board a whole belief system of there's me now, separate from these, this perfection that I have to reach in the future. So I, I've kind of believed in time, I've believed in myself, I've believed in existence, I've believed in all sorts of things. It's quite a complex body of beliefs that I'm holding when I think I'm going to be perfect in the future. But do I recognise that? Do I recognise <coughs> that that's actually beliefs that I'm holding? What would happen if I became much simpler and became interested in holding beliefs? What's that? What is holding beliefs? What are these beliefs that I'm holding? Sort of relaxing into that, which would be more, more honest in a way, isn't it? Because the rest of it's a whole construction of you know, my ideas about the future. But then that seems to be, you sort of think, well, how does that tie in with the idea of having an aspiration to reach Buddhahood? <coughs> and that, that seems to be, you know, this tremendous project. You know, like how can I have that, how can I hold that intention to reach enlightenment in order to deliver all beings? How can I hold that at the same time as not projecting forward? The answer is, you've got to find out how. <laughs> <laughs> it does seem like a contradiction. If you didn't have the aspiration, you wouldn't even be motivated to find out how you could get those two things to match. So you have to have that very strong motivation, and then you're left with a conundrum. How do I follow that amazing Bodhisattva path and keep that kind of vision, and at the same time remain very simple with my present experience? And that's where the discovery is important. So by staying with your experience, how it really is, you discover something. So this is the point. Rinpoche calls it, there's an inspiration in that. 
you could say he's, he does use inspiration for Adishtana often. There is some Adishtana in that. There's some some yeah, blessing of some sort, something, some power within that that actually will work for work for our benefit. And it's sure that that will happen because if you let go. The Adishtana of your true nature naturally is going to shine forth. There's no way it can't. So, actually, there is a path there. If that weren't the case, you could have a doubt about it. You think, well, you know, what's. There is no path because if I make an aspiration and then I try to be become a Buddha, then I won't because I'm just feeding my own notions. And if I let go of all my notions, then nothing happens. <laughs> but actually it's not true. Something does happen. And that's where you have to kind of take a, take a leap. Like, like with anything. You have to kind of any kind of action, anything you do in life, you have to take a leap, don't you? You have to kind of trust something, even just to put a piece of food in your mouth. <coughs> or just to kind of step out of the door, or get out of bed in the morning. <laughs> there has to be some trust, so that's, you discover something, and then you learn to trust that. And as you're trusting it, you learn to live it. You learn to live it as uh, a natural process. And Prabhupada used to like to stress that, didn't he, about your practice needs to become just like, what did he call it? Breakfast, I think. <laughs> just something you just get on with, you just, you just do it. It's kind of inseparable from your daily way of going about life. In many ways I found reading Cutting Through Spiritual Materialism increased my paranoia. <laughs> It kind of, I became even more self-conscious about my practice than I had ever been, ever, before. And yet, if you read it, if you read it very carefully, you start to realise that that promise is there. That yes, you can get more and more paranoid, but the reason why you're getting more and more paranoid is because you already were paranoid. You were already trying to get it right, and you thought you were more than you ended up thinking when you finished reading the book. <laughs> <laughs> and you start to realise we have a strong investment in wanting to be right, don't we? I just want to make sure that I'm right, and I'm doing right, and it's very egocentric. Very centred on me being right, rather than actually what's true and I can take it whatever it is it's true I can take it it's not going to destroy me which is a different kind of attitude isn't it so okay I read spiritual materialism and I read into it everything I do it doesn't destroy me actually it's okay all those mistakes going to take a long time. Nobody said it would be quick. Nobody's saying that, okay, you should now, from now on, practice without making a single mistake. That's the point, isn't it? It's, in many ways, it's very humbling. You know, oh, you know, yes, I do all those things. And it's okay. That makes me a practitioner. If I didn't have all those things, I wouldn't need to be a practitioner, would I? <laughs> so, 
take heart. <laughs> take heart from the fact that you, you're starting to recognize those things and realizing, I may be doing them, but at least I now recognize that they're not it. So, you know. And actually being, what would be it would actually be dropping a lot of stuff rather than somehow, as Rinpoche calls it, getting a transplant or <laughs> becoming completely different from how you are now. It's really like embracing the way you are now with more kindness, more sensitivity, more interest, lightness. But rigor, <laughs> not laziness. <laughs>